Hello and welcome to Austin Wednesdays. This is the January edition and I'm really excited to be speaking this month to the really fabulous Paula Byrne, who is an expert on all things Austin, but in particular on theatricality in Austin, Jane Austen and the theatre, um, Jane Austen adaptations, the theatre in Jane Austen novels. So we're going to be having a really, um, a really lovely theatrical chat. Um, and I'm really looking forward to that because theatre and live performance is one of the things that I've been missing most um, all of last year throughout all the various lockdowns and you know difficult times that we've been having. One of the things that I'm really hopeful for uh, this year is to be able to go to the theatre again. Um, but in the meantime, I have been really enjoying reading about Jane Austen's love of theatre. Um, and the, um, the book, which Paula wrote a number of years ago, actually, which has recently been relaunched, um, is The Genius of Jane Austen. And this goes into some real depth about how much Jane Austen loved the theatre and how significant it was in her life, um, how much it inspired her with her own writing. So that's something that I'm really looking forward to going through with Paula and talking about and pulling apart and dissecting this evening. Um, before we go straight on to that interview, I just want to um, take two seconds of your time, a li really, really little plea for our roof appeal. Um, unfortunately, the Hampshire winters are not sparing the roof this year. It's in really bad shape. So if you do have any spare money at all, and I'm completely aware that that's not possible for many people at the moment, it's a really hard time. We really understand that. But if you are enjoying this content and if you do have any money to spare, we would absolutely love you to sponsor a roof tile. Um, we'll put a link in the um, notes below or if you go to the website, there's a big red button that you can press to sponsor a roof tile and that would help us enormously. I also just want to say thank you for watching and um, and sharing and liking and telling your friends about these videos. It means so much to us. We would love to hear from you about what you think, what you're enjoying, what you want to see more of. Please talk to us, um, email the museum or talk to us on social. We'd absolutely love to hear from you. And without further ado, we're going to get cut straight through to the fabulous Paula Byrne. Paula, thank you so much for joining us. This is really exciting. I'm really looking forward to our discussion. And we're going to be talking about Jane Austen and theatre and all the different ways in which uh, Jane Austen was inspired by theatre, the theatre that she went to, the theatre that she loved, and also how theatre sort of finds its way into her works. And then hopefully if we've got time, also a little bit about how theatre loves Jane Austen and all the ways in which she then, you know, has her works have been turned into stage plays and films and theatre adaptations and all of those things that we love today. Um, but I thought let's start right at the beginning. So when Jane Austen is just a little girl and she's living in Steventon and she is living in quite a theatrical family. Can you tell me a little bit about that, about how theatre was sort of in her life at that early stage? Of course, yes, and uh, hello everybody. It's lovely to be here and thank you to the Jane Austen House Museum for, for inviting me to, to do this. It's lovely to be here. Um, so yeah, we'll start from, from that beginning. I think it's really important to remember that Jane Austen came from a large family, um, mainly of boys um, who were very interested in the arts and culture and theater. Um, and she, uh, as one of the younger siblings, um, she would have seen a lot of theatricals, private theatricals, as we call them, um, in the barn, first of all, in, 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 the, in the dining room. And then as they became slightly more professionalized, they moved into the barn. How do we know that? Well, when Jane Austen's father sold, uh, uh, sorry, didn't sell, gave, it moved on to Bath, um, they sold um, the theatrical scenes. And I think that's quite interesting because I think they must have been pretty good because if you're going to sell <laughs> amateur theatrical scenes um then you would expect them to be you know quite 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 um, professional and I think that gives us an indication of just how seriously the Austin family took theatricals um and we know other things about Jane Austen's um youth that she wrote little plays um that she 
um, was a, herself a very good actor and, and a very good reader. Um, so I think it's it was so such a formative experience for this this incredibly imaginative and clever young girl to slightly be on the periphery because she would have been quite, fairly young at the time. Um, but watching Henry particularly, who, who was a good actor, and James. Um, James wrote a lot of plays. And then, of course, the very exotic cousin Eliza de Foyard, who was very into theatre and was Jane's favourite person for a long time, other than her sister. Um, so I think it's just really important to set that context in, in that this lively, theatre-loving, creative family. And she is brought up around that, that thriving culture. And it sounds, I think, it sort of sounds rather extraordinary to us today, but actually it was quite a, it was quite a popular pastime at the time. It, you know, sort of amateur theatricals at home weren't that unusual. Is that right? Well, it is right. I mean, they mushroomed, private theatricals just mushroomed all over England um, in, in the first, probably the last half of the 18th century. Um, and initially it was, it was the aristocrats that were doing this. They had the money, the time, <laughs> the leisure. Um, and so some of the great stately homes would put on very elaborate plays and, and they would have tickets and, and they would, um, it, it would be almost semi-professional. And there's all sorts of reasons why that happened. One of the reasons was the Licensing Act of 1737 that restricted theatre. So it was a way of circumventing the law and you could put on slightly more racy plays. Um, but it trickled down, it, like many of these things do with the aristocracy, they percolate down to the middle classes. Um, and so by, by Jane Austen's time, um, you're finding more, more gentrified amateur theatricals. You know, it's a great way of passing the time. Um, it's fun. If you don't have a theatre close to you, you're bringing it to your home. So it, it was very, very popular. Um, and I think it's interesting that Jane Austen's mother was really supported it. And, and we know that one of Jane Austen's cousins was anxious about appearing on, on the Steventon stage. And Jane Austen's mother really thought she was a bit of a prude. Um, and I think that's that's really interesting, too. But yes, it, so by, by, certainly by the time Jane Austen was between five and ten, I say this percolation had, had happened with, with, with the gentry. I think it's really interesting, sort of, it's really important, isn't it, that we remember that her family was so creative in their own right. I think most people now just sort of think of Jane Austen in her own little bubble, just sort of existing with nothing around her. But it, it I mean, all of her family were creative and lively and they loved games and theatre and writing. So, I mean, that's a really sort of quite an important part that she was simply following in their footsteps. Um, and James in particular, I suppose, was was kind of, you know, partly her role model in that way with all of his writing. Um, so we know he wrote prologues for some of the plays. Do we know which plays they performed? Uh, we do. So Sheridan was a great, um, uh, was a great favourite. Um, and then some ha Hannah Cowley, I, I got, when I, I was writing the book, I got very interested in female dramatists like Hannah Cowley and Elizabeth Inchbald. And it's quite fascinating that they are some of the plays that the Austens performed. So they were supporting women. And yeah. there's one of, the, one of the epilogues that James wrote that I really like is one which is incredibly feminist, proto-feminist, where it talks about um, women's rights. And it, it was written for Eliza de Foyard. Um, and and so not only were they quite ahead of their time in in having their own theatre at Steventon, they were also ahead of their time in, in in female emancipation, as they called it then, and and had these incredibly feisty epilogues for women saying, "In the battle of the sexes, we're going to win," you know, and and. You can't underestimate the effect of that on, on, on Jane Austen and just being around that incredible atmosphere where it's not just let's have fun, but it's also what are women's rights? Where, where are we in the battle of the sexes? How, how are things playing out there? And of course, it had an immense effect on, on Jane Austen. And as you said, James was, was James and Henry, but James, the real driver, I think, and fancied himself as, you know, quite a, quite a writer and so wrote prologues and epilogues. And so we are able to see which plays were performed. I say Sheridan, 
the rival school for scandal. Um, later on, Jane Austen was rumoured to have played Mrs. Kander in, in School for Scandal. Um, so I, I think again, it was just such um, such a formative um, environment for her, and I think a lesson in learning dialogue. I think even at that very young age, she would have been around people who were were, were acting, and, and you know, her ear for dialogue is so incredible, and it must have been helped, enhanced by being immersed in that work. I mean, when you think about the, the comedies of Sheridan and you think about Hannah Cowley and Inchbald and all of, and Shakespeare, obviously, um, she's learning how dialogue works. Yeah, and, and I suppose also not only the sort of proper theatricals in the Playhouse in the Barn, but also that kind of, just simply that sort of family um, thing that they had of, of reading aloud. And I suppose if we think of Jane Austen's works all in the context of being read aloud to the family kind of round the fire in, in the drawing room after dinner, that's perhaps another reason why the dialogue is so sparkling because it, they're designed for, for voices rather than to be read in your head. Oh, I completely agree with you, Sophia. I, I'm very, very interested in the whole reading aloud um, leisure activity because you know there wasn't much to do of a cold winter's night. And reading aloud was a huge part of family entertainment. And we know that Jane Austen got frustrated with her mother for not reading um, the part in Pride and Prejudice as she wanted it to be read. And, and the, you know, that gives us a massive clue as to how much you know, the, the, the theatre meant to her, how much dialogue meant to her, how much she had it in her head, how things should be read. Um, we know that she read, um, she was a great fan of um, Fanny Burney. We know that Evelina was a favourite to be read aloud. And one of her nieces said it was almost, hearing Jane Austen read aloud was almost like being at the play. Um, and I think that's just a huge compliment to Jane Austen's acting skills. Yeah. Um, but I am very interested in reading aloud. And I think I absolutely agree that I think one of the reasons that dialogue is so fantastic is because it, it was meant to be read aloud. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it just sort of wants to, it sort of makes you want to go back and read everything aloud, doesn't it? Just to sort of hear it in that different way. Um, oh, yeah. So you, meant, you mentioned Eliza de Faid earlier, and I've got to say, hands up, she's one of my favourite characters in the cast of the sort of the Austen family. Um, and I guess that not only was she quite, I mean, she was obviously very into theatricals, and we should say she is um, Jane Austen's older cousin, um, is she straight? Is she a first cousin? She's she's a first. She is she's a first, first cousin, cousin, but she's quite a bit older. Um, yeah. And she comes over and stays with the Austins a number of times whilst Jane is is quite a young girl. And she's this sort of larger than life character, very beautiful, very vivacious, um, and and plays the heroine in a number of the family theatricals. But is also quite a theatrical sort of character in her own right quite sort of you know she enjoys being center of attention I suppose it's fair to say um I wonder if you could talk a little bit about her I mean it sort of slightly goes off the, the sort of strict theatrical sort of topic but she's just such a wonderful character and I, I suppose I think that she sort of brings the theatricality to Jane Austen's childhood oh I, I completely agree she she's so important uh, as an influence and so she is the she's the daughter of Jane Austen's father's sister, beloved sister Philadelphia, and um, so first cousin, and did lead a very exotic life. She was born in in India, and then li they lived in France. She was French speaking. She'd married a count. Um, she was um, incredibly beautiful and well read. Her handwriting is exquisite. I've I've seen her her, her letters and her, and just beautiful handwriting. And yeah, she she descends upon this Hampshire family, you know, like this bird of prey, you know, just as with all her feathers and she's gorgeous. And I see no reason to disbelieve the rumors that both Henry and James fell in love with her. And, and I do, and I think um, they fell in love with her when they were acting together. And this is something that Jane Austen would later exploit in Mansfield Park, flirtation as part of that. But she loved Eliza. I mean, she Eliza loved Jane. She preferred her to Cassandra. Um, she encouraged her. Again, we can't underestimate the influence of this. She was very into women's rights, female empowerment. She um, she she was feisty. She was fiery. She was sort of Mary Crawford, um, and huge huge 
influence. And I think when anybody who's sort of elegant and beautiful and clever takes interest in a young girl, it means a lot when you're young, when and when somebody you look up to takes an interest in you. I, you know, I think it's a yeah, huge thing. impressionable. Yeah, and uh, exactly. And, and children can sometimes be, you know, go away. You sort of boring, but it, it, it's clear that Eliza, you know, saw something in 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 Jane Austen and really um, cultivated a friendship. And uh, you know, when le when later on, when Jane Austen went to stay with Eliza, and went, by then she'd married Henry, her, Jane Austen's favorite brother, and they would often go to the theatre together. So. That, that that love of theatre was almost indistinguishable from the love of, Ali, of Eliza. Eliza was associated with that kind of creative, theatrical, and as you said, theatrical in character, as well as, as bringing theatre to, to, to the Austen family, but huge, huge influence on Jane Austen. I love that image of her as kind of descending as this kind of rather gorgeous bird of prey, because she does have a kind of a bit of a, a bit of darkness to her as well, doesn't she? You sort of do feel quite very Mary Crawford like. You do feel like she's not a hundred percent sort of, you know, the the good the good character, but she is so fascinating that you can completely understand that Jane Austen is just sort of totally besotted by her, as are her brothers. So clearly the whole family is just in love with this beautiful, beautiful woman. And I suppose that brings me on to the next sort of bit that I'm really interested in is this kind of the way that um theatricals are kind of synonymous with flirting and and sort of fancying each other and sort of the way the way that even today I think um sort of acting has a kind of a bit of a danger a bit of spice related to it you know there are often stories about actors sort of you know having relationships on set because you're because you're thrown together I suppose and you're kind of you might be acting that you're in love and then that sort of turns into love in a way. And obviously that's something that Jane Austen explored in Mansfield Park. But I do think that's a really fascinating area, particularly in the context of the time, because acting was still considered a bit a bit risque. It hadn't it wasn't so long before that that women weren't allowed to act at all because of that sort of idea that it was a bit dangerous. Oh, for sure. Um and I think you're absolutely right that there's a sort of intimacy about acting with somebody, particularly of the opposite sex, um, and, um, and and danger and, and illicit sort of flirtation. Mm. And because just by the very nature of acting, you're touching, you, you touch one another, you know, you're, 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 you're intimate. And chemistry, as we all know, is really important between actors. And that chemistry is something I think Jane Austen got interested, probably saw as a child, because there must have been some sort of sexual chemistry between Henry and Eliza, because they got married. Yes. <laughs> clearly, clearly there was, it wasn't just cousins, you know, acting together. It, it clearly went beyond um, that. And again, that's something that Jane Austen exploits brilliantly in, in Mansfield Park, which we'll talk about later when there is intimacy between um, Henry and Mariah, you know, they are embracing, yeah. they are kissing. Yeah. Uh, that is what the acting directions tell them to do. And if you think of that time where, you know, women are still chaperoned, women are, you know, Jane Austen is in London, she can't travel without her brothers. There are strict codes of behavior for females. Can you just imagine the excitement of, of them being in this where there's, there's nobody chaperoning you, Mrs. Norris is useless. Um, and and Mrs. Austen, I don't think her, she didn't care. She was happy for them all to, to flirt and have a great time. So I think flirting is definitely linked. And, I, and you're absolutely right, Sophie, that you know the, one of the reasons why theatre had in some circles a poor reputation was because actresses were seen as prostitutes. Mm. And there was a blurring of, and many of them were actually, or, or they were courtesans. They were courtesans. So somebody like Mary Robinson, who yeah. um, uh, Jane Austen high, cla was, high class courtesan. The high class courtesans, and you know, she was the Prince Regent's mistress and and, and an actress. Um, and so the the lines are quite blurred uh, on the stage. Yeah. So there's always that danger. But in a way, that danger gives it that frisson, I think, which um, is something that Jane Austen later exploits to such great effect. Yeah, I do think it's interesting, though, that they were able to choose plays which were so risque, you know, that they weren't kind of doing, um, you know, 
moral stories that were very prudish. They were really kind of able to let rip and kind of, I suppose it's a sort of way of experimenting and sort of learning to grow up, isn't it? Oh, for sure. And like, you know, plays like Which is the Man and some of the plays that they chose were again, quite a feminist, female-centered, women getting the better of men. You know, Eliza, I'm sure, had a hand in that. I mean, they were not putting on moral plays. They were putting on all sorts of fun and risky plays. Um, and again, the, you really get a sense that they're not being censured at all by um, George and Cassandra, the parents of, of the children. And we know that Jane Austen had full reign to her father's library. Um, we, we uh, you know, she, they were not prudes is what I'm trying to say. Mm, and, and they did, yeah. they, they didn't censure the, the children at all. And again, Jane Austen was the beneficiary of that. And again, you know, I always say she, she's a Georgian. She, she, she's not a Victorian. She comes from a time when, you know, it, it is more risque. It is a more risque time. Um, and we mustn't somehow think of her as a Victorian, which is kind of how the Jane Austen cult begins in 1870 when they actually, the paint, the only drawing of her, it looks like a, she looks like a Victorian. And I think we get confused sometimes. And I think we have to go back and say, look, this is a person who, she was brought up in this lively household in Georgian England, where the theatre was thriving, uh, where um, she had access, not just to private theatricals, but actually went to the public theatres as well. Yeah. Shall we get on to that? Shall we get on to her, sort of her first, her love of, of going to the theatre? Because um, I know that when she was an adult, she absolutely loved going to the theatre and she wrote about it in her letters. But do we know when she sort of first went, when she first experienced professional theatre? I mean, we don't know exactly, but she certainly went, um, when she was a young girl, they would, there was, there was um, a, a place that was an amphitheatre um, that lots and lots of children went to. So it, I, we sort of think of it as um, a prototype circus. So it would, you would have horses, it would be like a theatrical spec, spectacle with pageantry. And often a straight play would be sort of shoved in. So again, coming back to that censorship of the Licensing Act where the only prohibited um, legal theatres were Drury Lane, Covent Garden, and then the some of the Haymarket. Did this mean that the illegitimate theatres just all went to the ground? No, it didn't. It meant they, they just mushroomed and they just, they just found ways of getting around it. So um, Astley's Theatre is the one I was, I was just thinking of. Um, they would often sort of advertise and say, um, oh, come for coffee or hot chocolate. And, and then they'd smuggle in a play. And everybody knew this was happening. Um, but they might also have a farce or they might have a straight play. Now, in Drury Lane and Covent Garden, that was very much, you would have the straight play, five-act play usually, yeah. and then a right. farce. And from Jane Austen's letters, she, had, she was very eclectic. She, she loved the five-act plays, but she really enjoyed the farces. Um, and the farces are brilliant, actually. Some of the farces in the 18th century are absolutely fantastic. And um, she loved she loved the farces and, and, and really she was not a snob. So we yeah. know that as, as a young person, she did go along to places like Astley's. Later on, she took her nieces to Astley's um, Equestrian Theatre, which was a big one. Um, and then um, when later on, when she moved to Bath, she went to the theatre. I, mean, I know somebody asked a question, we can come back to this later about Southampton, so we'll save yeah. that for a bit. But I would say from a child, from being a child, she would have gone to, you know, as I say, more of a, almost like a pantomime, like taking yeah. a child to a pantomime. And that would have given her a taste of live theatre that then as she grew older, she would be taken to more serious plays like Shakespeare. Yeah, yeah. So she knows from a really early age. And that's something that I really love um, that you can sort of see in her teenage writings that she's sort of exploring, just sort of testing the ground with all these different um, art forms that she's sort of absorbing. So she's reading voraciously and then she's kind of, you know, writing versions and sort of, you know, sort of playfully exploring the different types of, of reading matter. But then she's also, it, you know, seeing performance and she writes a number of her sort of, of her teenage writings are theatrical in their form. So I wondered if we could talk about that a little bit about, um, there are sort of three that you particularly talk about in the book. Um, particularly the one that I think is hilarious is is the mystery where she's kind of 
really satirizing another play but there's sort of no content it's sort of all about smoke and mirrors and you know sort of what you can get away with in theatre which I just love oh yeah I mean it's it's almost like a, it's such a black humor and she was so young when she was doing that and again she we know that she loves uh, in those early writings burlesque um satire um she was a big fan of Fielding's plays before Fielding became a novelist he was a playwright and one of her favorites was was um a play called Tom Thumb which was a brilliant satire it was a political satire and one of the reasons why Fielding turned to the novel as a form was because of the licensing act and the way that he was treated by the theater because they felt he was too political. Right. Um, and the plays like The Mystery, out of context, you sort of think, what's going on? But yeah, it's so weird. Sort of, it's so weird, but you're absolutely right. I mean, if you, she's parodying brilliantly bad plays. <laughs> Sometimes she's parodying good plays. Um, but the sort of what she really likes is absurdity. Like she loves the absurd. So, you know, in the mystery, people sit on each other's laps and, you know, for no particular reason. Um, it, and I, I think when they were performed at Steventon, they must have just been dying of laughter because they were so surreal. Um, it's almost like something out of Monty Python, I feel, when you look at it. You just, a parrot, you know, you if a parrot came out of some, you know, you wouldn't be surprised. And, and to think that she was so young when she's when she's doing this and the temerity of her saying, actually, a lot of plays are really rubbish and, and quite naff. And I'm going to write something that's more naff, because not only is it really funny to do that, but it also shows that a lot of plays are really naff. That, that's what I feel that she's doing there as a young child. And you know, she does write these little playlists. And I, I suspect they were used, you know, if they put on a performance of, say, Hannah Cowley's Witch is the Man, which is a very funny, sparkling comedy, they would probably have had this as the sort of farcical afterpiece. I'm almost convinced that's why she wrote them. And, and you're right, Sophie, that what she's doing there as a young girl is, is she's experimenting with, um, with all sorts of, of genres. But I, I go back to burlesque because Fielding, I, I mentioned Fielding before, who's such a big influence on Jane Austen. And I mean, his, his, burlesques his political satires are really really funny and she's learning from fielding she's learning about how you do parody how far you can take it how much you can do satire she loves silly words pammy diddle village you know she likes all she likes absurd language as well a lot of that she's getting from fielding because the austin brothers really admired fielding's plays um so again it's just another we forget that she grew up around this. It was meat and drink, you know, it was just there. Um, and of course that's going to be reflected in, in those early, early write the juvenile writings, the teen writings, and then refined for when she's writing the mature novels. Yeah, yeah. Um, so you mentioned it, we did have a question about Southampton. So let's move on a little bit in her life. So she has left Steventon, she's in her twenties and she's living in Bath and then in Southampton. So let's actually let's talk about Bath for a moment, because um, obviously when she's in, you know, she's in Steventon and they can go to London occasionally and she's sort of maybe having her first taste of professional theatre and there are a number of theatres in London. But then when she gets to Bath, she's so lucky because Bath has a wonderful theatre and she's seeing plays probably quite a lot when she's there. Oh, I'm sure she is. I mean, really frustratingly, we don't have many letters from that, that that long period of time when she's in, in, in Bath. But we know she definitely went to the theatre, that there's evidence of that. Um, and I think the thing, important thing to remember is, you know, when she's in Hampshire, it's not that easy to get to the London theatres. You know, it's a bit of a palaver. She has to be taken by one of the brothers and she's got to get there. But it's so easy in Bath. It's so easy to get to. And not only that, it's a fantastic theatre. I mean, it's where many of the big London actors cut their teeth. So. Siddons, um, George Cook, who was fantastic, Keen. Um, her favorite actor was, was William Elliston, who I became very interested in. Um, and he was the big star at, at Bath. In, during the time Jane Austen lived in Bath, he was called the fortnightly actor because every fortnight he'd, be, he'd go up to London um, and do a gig. And then he, but he was based in Drury Lane, um, in uh, Bath Theatre Royal. Later on, he left and went to London and Jane Austen lamented this and, and she blamed the wife for dragging him away from, from, from Bath. The best Elliston is what she called him and he was known as the best Elliston. 
Um, and so she she had this theatre on her doorstep. Um, and I, of course, she would have taken advantage of that and, 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 and would have gone. Um, and then when she left to live in South, went to live with her brother in Southampton, I know one of our our, our, our people asked a question about Southampton. Did she go to the theatre in Southampton? She did. And now this is a very different kettle of fish to the Theatre Royal. So you know, she's gone from one of the best provincial theatres in the country to the French Street Theatre, which is a bit grim, to be honest. Right. It's a bit grim and it's a bit grimy. Um, but it's starting to become quite quite popular. And um, we went when her niece Fanny came to visit they took Fanny to see a play with John Bannister um, in, the, in, in the French th Street Theatre. And also when Martha Lloyd came to stay, Jane Austen writes a letter when she says that she's going to take Martha um, to see the play. She makes a joke. She says she should see the, th the inside of theatre at least once, though I, I don't think she'll want to take a second look. Um, so we know that she went to the French Street Theatre when she lived in Southampton. So yes to the to the lovely reader who asked the question um, about Southampton, yes, she did. And also we have a, a, a little piece of paper that gives an account of money spent. And Jane Austen says that she spent 17 shillings on water parties and plays. So that is very firm evidence that she did in her small allowance. She thought theatre was sufficiently important to her that she would pay to go to the theatre, even though it was the French Street Theatre, and not brilliant by any means, but but certainly up and coming. So that and, and so that is yes, and so again, you know, this idea somehow that she disapproves of theatre, she doesn't like theatre, which had currency for a long time in Jane Austen studies, um, is just so not true. And, and that, that's what I was trying to do in my book from the start was to say, I just don't believe that Jane Austen was not interested in theatre. I just don't believe that she was suspicious of it morally. Quite the opposite. And it was just sort of how one consensus of, a, of critical opinion had sort of overtaken Jane Austen's studies. And, and what I was trying to do when I wrote the book and issues, my, it was my PhD thesis, um, was to unpick that and say, well, this just, it's rubbish. Of course she went to the theatre, here's the evidence. It's hard evidence. It's in the letters, it's in what we, we know, what she, you know, water parties and plays. Leisure is important to her. Leisure and pleasure is important to her. Um, so, um, so yeah, so, so she, yeah, great, great time in Bath and then great time in Southampton. And then for the rest of her life, it was generally the London theatres that she would then go to. Yes, yes. And actually, we have um, a letter in our collection, which was um, one that we acquired in 2019, um, which was written on the 29th of November in 1814, when she talks about going to the play and um, she's seen Miss O'Neill in playing Isabella. And she says that she didn't think it was that great. And she took two pocket handkerchiefs, but she had no reason to use either of them, which I just so love this idea that she's so, she's so sort of barbed about it. She's so kind of, she's saying, well, you know, I, I was expecting this to just, you know, I was expecting to be in floods and it, I wasn't moved by it at all. And I just sort of really love this idea that she's so, She's so astute, you know, she just knows exactly what she wants and she knows when things are bad. That's sort of my favorite thing about her really is that she's not afraid to say that things are bad. And I guess that's something that she's had from when she was a very little girl. She's kind of always known her mind. And that's probably part of her brilliance is that she's never afraid to, to say it like it is. You know, she's not flattering at the actors or, you know, or the people she went with or the people that, you know, took her or anything like that. So I love that, that when she's older, you know, she's, she loves the theatre and she's going as much as she can. And I suppose it's just, a, um, you know, it's a shame for us that there aren't more of the letters around to, to tell us more about what, what she saw. Um, but from the letters that do survive, I mean, do we know which playwrights she was particularly enjoying when she was, when she was an adult, when she's just sort of that little bit older? Did she, you know, do you have a sort of good sense of what her taste was then? Has it changed? I mean, first of all, how excited to have that letter because- Oh, I know, isn't it wonderful? Letter, it's wonderful. And, and, and you know, she, it's a wonderful um, satirical comment about the pocket handkerchiefs because um, because that particular actor, actress, Miss O'Neill, was known for making people cry. And it just shows, again, to me, how tuned in Jane Austen was um, to sort of theatrical parlance and jokes. 
And then she says something about, oh, she hugged Mr. Young delightfully. And she, yeah. uh, Eliza O'Neill was known as the hugging actress. So it's so brilliant, that letter, because she's showing just how, as I say, she's so tuned in to, oh, she's the one who makes everyone cry. She's, she's the one who's great giving hugs, you know. Um, it's, it's, it's a brilliant letter, so well done on acquiring that. That's absolutely brilliant. Um, so later on, what we do know is we know that she definitely um, liked Shakespeare. We know that she was disappointed that she didn't see Mrs. Siddons in King John. Um, she mentions um, Cassandra being seeing Dorothy Jordan, the great comic actress. Um, later on, she often went with her nieces. So some of the play choices were very much um, catered to their tastes. Um, so um, some of those melodramas, those you know, the she sort of she took the children along with her. But Shakespeare, for certain, was was, um, and I think an Edmund Keane. Yeah. She was really keen, and, and, and in Bath, they, the Austins were great fans of George Cook, who was an incredible actor uh, and a terrible drunkard. Um, and and um, th those jokes about George Cook just, you know, being drunk on stage, he was, you know, he was a sort of, um, you know, typical sort of Oliver Reed, brilliant, but sort of um, troubled person. Um, and and he was a great Shakespearean actor too. Rob, Elliston was a great, um, he could do both, Elliston. He did comedy and tragedy. He was very unusual um, in being um, very versatile, like David Garrick. He could do comedy brilliantly. He could do tragedy brilliantly, um, but was also um, Shakespeare. So it was, I think as she got older, you know, it was, she sometimes went for the actors rather than the play. So yeah. the evidence would seem to be in those later letters that she wants to see Keane, who has revolutionized the stage. I mean, people are just saying his acting is, it's so natural and it's not ranting, it's not mannered. And, you know, she, she, she couldn't wait to see Keane. She couldn't wait to see Mrs. Siddons. She couldn't wait to see Dora, Dora Jordan. So it seems that she was actually going for the act, which I think is really fascinating. It's like saying, oh, I went to see, you know, um, Ray Fiennes as Hamlet. Exactly. Uh, or it's such a modern you, way to be, so isn't modern, it? You know, what, Jude what Law. we all do. Yeah, I went to see Jude Law. I got tickets to Jude Law's Hamlet. And, you know, what nowadays we do this, we, we, we are led by the star. And this was a star system towards the end of the 18th century and beginning of the 19th century, when theatre is becoming much more respectable, partly because, mainly because of Mrs. Siddons, because Mrs. Siddons, um, Sarah Siddons, confers respectability onto the theatre in a way that no other actress had previously done. So all of a sudden, she's making theatre kosher, she's making it okay. Um, she presents herself as a mother first, not, not an actress stroke right. prostitute. So all of these shifts are happening in theatre. Um, and if, so she's there, Jane Austen's there at a very, very exciting time. And I think it's really interesting that she starts going, not so much, not different when she's taking the children, but when she's going herself, I think she's going for what she calls in Manson Park, good hardened acting. Um, and she's really overwhelmed and she sees Keane. It's, it's, it's obvious that she's very moved by Keane. And, um, and also I was very interested, she goes to see um, a production of Don Dewin and she calls him a, a, a compound of cruelty and lust. And she's quite taken by this lustful, um, cruel character. Um, again, no prude. Of course, yeah. we know she's no prude, but sometimes people have this idea that she, she is. So she was definitely led by good, hardened, real acting, I would say, towards towards the end, as she grows up and starts going to the good London theatres. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I suppose that's quite natural, isn't it? She's growing up. Her taste is is developing. Um, so I think we better talk about Mansfield Park because that is kind of the elephant in the room. We keep on, keep on sort of circling around it because, I mean, this is why... Jane Austen has had in the past that kind of reputation of being quite sort of critical about theatre and not liking theatre is because of the scene in, in Mansfield Park where um, the, the characters stage Lover's Vows and I think it's a really fascinating one. I was really enjoying reading about this in your book because Lover's Vows was obviously a play that she was very familiar with, um, had probably seen and would have read um, and, and it's very risque. I mean when you read Mansfield Park, you sort of pick up that it's, um, Edmund disapproves of it. And it obviously has characters which are, you know, 
a little bit, um, you know, the ladies shouldn't necessarily be playing them. But actually, it, it really was quite, it was really pushing some boundaries at the time. Like, can tell me more a little bit about, about that, sort of what was the play? Where did it come from? Well, you know, you're just absolutely right. I mean, it, it really was ris risque. And you're right to say that she knew it and she would have probably seen it. I think it was performed at least 15 times in Bath when she lived there. Okay. And um, she, the, the other really important point to make about Lover's Vows um, is that she expects all her readers to know it intimately. Because when if you don't know Lover's Vows and you read that episode, that whole debacle, a lot of it just doesn't make sense. You, you don't get the full nuance unless you know. And, and so it seems incredible to me that she's that confident that her readers will know this mm -hmm. and that she doesn't have to spell it out. So, so she's not apologizing for her intimate novel, uh, knowledge of, of Lover's Vows at all. One of the most risky uh, moments uh, in, in Lover's Vows, and one of the reasons why it had a, a reputation was um, a, a proposal is made by a woman to a clergyman mm. and that was perceived as really risky. But again, to me, it is Jane Austen interested in female emancipation. Why shouldn't a woman ask a man? Why shouldn't a woman propose marriage? And that was seen as really, really not OK. And I think when Edmund takes offence, he thinks that's not OK. So how brilliant is it that Mary takes that part in which she proposes marriage to Edmund and gets him very hot under the collar, let's say. Um, so, so Jane Austen's expecting people are going to know that the part that Mary Crawford's playing is sexually risque, and she has no problem with this at all. And I, also what she's doing with, with that, that brilliant sort of first third of Mansfield Park, which is entirely really devoted to the theatricals. And indeed, it, the end of the first volume is that hideous moment when they're just about to perform and Julia comes running in and says my father my father's home you know and it's so theatrical in itself yeah. it's like a curtain being drawn as though you're sitting in the theatre I mean it's doubly theatrical um and and but uh, but she she uses lover's vows in all sorts of fantastically elusive ways um because you know it it, it means it gives Henry the chance to um, I mean, he's actually playing the character's son. So he's playing the part of, of a man called Frederick. And Mariah and Julia are fighting over the role of his mother. Why? Well, I'll tell you why. Because in the very first scene, when he discovers that it's his mother, he, he throws his arms and embraces her, kisses her. Now, it may be a maternal kiss, Mm. But that's so risky. That is so yeah. risky. And at, at one point, um, he ha he holds her hand. And if, if you remember from Mansfield Park, even when Sir Thomas comes in, M Henry ha keeps holding Mariah's hand, um, and she takes that as a sign that it's more than just the play, and that he is really interested in her. And it's so vicious and cruel of him to do that because she is engaged to somebody else. Um, and, and he holds her hand. So, so the reason those two girls are vying for that role is they want to be kissed by Henry. I mean, it's that simple. And yeah. it, it's the perfect play for all of those flirtations. And then, and then for Fanny, you know, to be on the periphery and, and be looking at, you know, Fanny's famous quote is, you know, she says, I was quiet, but I was not blind. And the reason that she, she knows what Henry's about is because she's been watching him. She's watching him perform. She's watching him act. She thinks he's a wonderful actor. She, she admires his acting, but she also sees that he's using it to play a game and she doesn't like game plays. And, and again, that's why you know, people confuse Jane Austen with Fanny. And because Fanny disapproves of, of the play, they think Jane Austen disapproves of the play, which is just not the case at all. And in some ways, Fanny gets very caught up in the play as, as, as it goes on because she sees this wonderful acting and she gets involved in the play. Um, so, so she uses it in all sorts of, of brilliant in, interweaving characters, real characters, fictional characters, 
or in the play, off the play. Um, but I say with this expectation that her readers will know what what she's what she's alluding to, and I think that is utterly fascinating. Yeah, absolutely. But I suppose it's something that we do today as well. I mean, we would have popular culture that just alluded to a very well-known plot, wouldn't we? I mean, Romeo and Juliet, you wouldn't expect to have the plot explained because you would just expect everyone to know it. So it is it is fascinating that that's just sort of part of the background to, to her life. I exactly. do think it's it's fascinating that sort of that thing about Fanny's attitude in Mansfield Park because obviously a little bit later in the novel, um, uh, Henry Crawford is reading Shakespeare aloud and she gets completely caught up in it and then has this thing where she's like, no, no, I don't want to be. I need to sort of break away from that. And she's kind of denying her own um, her own sort of natural reaction to it. There's something really fascinating, sort of weird psychological responses going on oh, there. I mean, I do, I, I think that scene is absolutely brilliant. Because as you say, she is being seduced there. Um, she's being seduced by Henry. He is such a brilliant actor. And the fact that he chooses Shakespeare, which again, he probably does that deliberately because he knows Fanny will like it um, because it's sort of respectable, Shakespeare's respectable. But mm. she's so seduced, she's so bedazzled by his acting. And as you say, there is a real sense of her sort of pulling between no no I can't I can't fall in love with this man you know he, he but he is so attractive he is so seductive and and I mean he's such a brilliant actor and anyone who can read Shakespeare like him can't be stupid you know all of these things you feel are rushing through her mind um and then it is a bit like you know the devil on one shoulder and the angel on the other shoulder that she's sort of saying um you know like F Faust you know oh gosh I can't be attracted to this man and Jane Austen's having great great fun there because She's almost, you know, she's almost saying to Fanny, "Oh, you were a bit of a prude when you sat there, you know, with lovers' vows," um, because Fanny knows that there's a lot of hugging and kissing and touching going on because she's she's watching it. Um, but here you are, and you're being seduced by his acting and it, ability and his incredible charisma. Um, and and so it's, I think that's Jane Austen again being very playful. With, mm. with with Fanny and and I think I'm glad you mentioned that scene because I think it's absolutely crucial because it also sets in place you know is Henry going to succeed is he going to win Fanny over and and, and we need that jeopardy I mean you know and we know that like, Henry Austin wrote to Jane Austen saying oh, what what you know what's going to happen is she going to go with Henry she's going to stay what, you know and all the family going what are you going to do and somebody saying please make her stick with Henry and, and you know she, she's got that jeopardy moment and, and it, it's so important that moment in the play because we need to in the, in the novel because we need to think might she do this might she go with this this villain this rake um and but so, you almost yeah. don't, I don't almost feel like he is a villain at that point you know you you almost do want him to succeed because it is so attractive you know you're sort of thinking yeah he is he's he's a brilliant actor he's incredibly charming and you know all of these things are in his favor and all I've oh, I always find it so frustrating you think come on like Fanny you're just being so prudish about this I do find it really extraordinary that people get Jane Austen and, and Fanny sort of muddled up in that way yeah, because it yeah. seems to me like she's not at all telling us that that this is the right way to be it's you know it's quite a quite a leap for her no it is it is and I say I think it's only because we have to remember what Fanny has seen you know th th that's the important thing is that she has seen a lot it, during rehearsals that mm. we're not always privy to as readers and we have to be good readers when, when, when she says I, I was quiet but I was not blind we've got to be better readers and we've got to say you know we've got to read Fanny if you like We've got to read Fanny seeing that deep down, she knows his heart is black, that he yeah. is a bit of a love lace, that he is, he's never really going to change, but he's got to be so charming. He's got to be, you know, like Willoughby, you know, they are, these men are charming. They have so much charm, but they have quite black hearts. And, and, and it's, it, I, oh, I feel such sympathy for Fanny because, I just think she's so brilliant. She can see right through him, but she's still attracted to him, you know. And, and yeah, we're fighting it, desperately trying to keep it down. 
Yeah, like well, Tony's not good looking from the start. He's not good looking. And Jane Austen makes that really clear from very early on. He's not, he's not good looking. It's his charm. It's his acting. It's it's his wit. And, and we all fall in love with Henry with, with, with Crawford, as we do fall in love with Mary Crawford. And and I think Jane Austen's having such fun with that. She's having such fun with the male readers about to fall in love with Mary and not falling in love with Fanny because she's so dull and and the female readers being drawn to Henry Crawford and Rushworth's obviously a fool and Edmund's a bit of a prig so we can't sort of really fall in love with Edmund um very much and and I think Jane Austen is having such fun with that she's having such fun with sort of upending our notions of of of, of sexual attraction as well because it's clear to me in, in, in the episode you just quoted that there is some sort of sexual attraction going on there with 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 Fanny and, and she pulls back from that like she's pulling back because she thinks I've seen what he's done to those two sisters I've seen the trouble he's caused I saw his hand being I saw him keeping hold of Mariah's hand um I saw Julia being ostracized and miserable so she's just she is actually being quite feminist as well I think I think she's been quite you know sisterly I've seen the damage he, he's done and you're not going to do it to me. But then of course he does charm her and he comes to Portsmouth and he, he is seen in his best light. And Jane Austen's too fine a writer to make someone just a villain or someone just a heroine. She's interested in nuance and she's interested in, in dark and light. Um, and and I, I, I think he's so fascinating, Henry Crawford. I think when he comes to Portsmouth and he's nice to her family uh, and she suddenly sees him again in, in, Oh my goodness! This this man's more than I thought he was. So she's constantly. Do you know what I mean? She's constantly sort of upending our notions of of what we should what we should feel. I mean, the most important thing is Fanny's just not in love with him. She's in love with Edmund. So it doesn't really matter how charming. If someone is the most charming man in the world, but you're in love with someone else, you're not going to fall in love with them. So she's she's just having, I think, a lot of fun with 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 that. I love Man Mansell Park is my favorite novel. Yeah, I, I, it's one I struggle with because I love it, but I, I find Fanny such a difficult heroine that, <laughs> that I sort of, I'm with her and I'm with her and then I'm just like, oh, just let, just loosen up a little bit. But it is, it is a wonderful character study. The fact that she knows that he's, she knows that he's a bad guy, but he has these wonderful sort of assets to his character and he's a wonderful performer. He's so charismatic. And, and that is true. We, you know, you do end up fancying someone that you know is the bad guy and you sort of fight it and you know that you can't follow through with that, but, but you still have the attraction there. And I think that that is, it's really, you're right. It's so true that that is, that that's put in there and it's sort of acknowledged. Yeah, like, you know, every girl loves a bad guy, you know, yeah. the, the devil has the, the devil has the best lines as, as Milton said. Um, so, you, you know, you, you, you definitely, you know, even nice girls like a bad boy, you know, um, and 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 she and she is playing with that, and, and there is that moment of jeopardy where, you know, you genuinely think she might go off with Henry that that Henry has reformed because he comes to Portsmouth and he says, "I've become a better person because of you. I've become a better landlord because of you," and then he brings out the best in her family. He sees that she's pretty malnourished in Portsmouth and that she's ill, and he's doing everything he can to to help her. And, and you really do see Henry, I think, at his best. And, and the temptation there is, with the love of a good woman like Fanny, and Jane Austen says right at the end, he should have stuck with that because had, had he married Fanny, she would have reformed him. Um, mm. she, she, would have, she would have been a good wife for him. Um, but, you know, Fanny ultimately doesn't choose to do that. But, but that's why I think he is a, a bit sort of fascinating one of the most fascinating of her male characters, like for me, you know, Willoughby is a cad, and he's we all know Willoughby's a cad. Um, and he is what he is. He's a handsome fortune hunter, you know. And Henry's not that. Henry's got his own money and he's not that. Um, he he is much more complex, and, and, and that's why I think a lot of people are very drawn to, to Henry Crawford. He's really fascinating character in Jane Austen's novels so and it, and it is a fascinating sort of plot point where you get to that point where it splits and you genuinely you do look back and think if she had married him it probably would have all been okay so maybe she should have married him I sort of really I think I'm gonna stick with this <laughs> with this position yeah. I think she probably should have married him because 
then everyone would have ended up, you know, Edmund could have married somebody else and she probably would have fallen in love with him properly over time. And, and actually that is quite true to human nature, isn't it? You know, not everyone does always get to follow through with their first crush. You know, quite often you end up with somebody else further down the line and that's fine, it all works exactly. out. Exactly, like Marianne Dashwood ends up with Colonel Brandon. Exactly. And yeah. I, I, think, I think that's absolutely right. And, and you're certainly in good company because there was, there was one of Jane Austen's relations, I can't remember which one, who said, you know, I would, n I'll never forgive you for not letting Fanny marry Henry. You know, it was so you can imagine the family having these rows and saying, you've got to let, and but she's got her plot, she's got her plot in her head, she's not going to do it. But you know, so one of them says, you know, how could you, how could you not let this happen? And we, we really wanted Fanny to be with with Henry and not that prig Edmund. Um, and I'm, I'm kind of with you. Like I think she, she'd, you know, she, she should have had. She should have let him, him marry. And then, of course, Mariah's ostracised. Her life's ruined um, exactly. because, because of Henry. Fanny's fault, really. Yes. <laughs> in, some, in, a, in a way. <laughs> but that's what's so wonderful, isn't it? That they're so realistic. And it really, it feels, it feels just like sort of family gossip. That it really feels like this is, is really happening. And you really care about, about what they're doing. Um, we are so nearly running out of time, but I think we better leap very quickly, five minutes on um, adaptations, because something that your book points out, which I hadn't really thought about before, but which makes so much sense, is about the fact that Jane Austen's writing, because the dialogue is, because it's so dialogue heavy, sounds like a bad word, but because it's, um, because it doesn't rely on lots of description, because she leaps straight into action and dialogue, it, that's in a way why they're so perfect for adaptations and there obviously are myriad adaptations for theatre and tv and film and they seem to be coming out all the time it seems to be a kind of mainstay of you know whenever the bbc whenever anyone needs to make a new film they think oh could it possibly be an adaptation either a straight one or in a sort of strange new form um mm -hmm. And I just wonder sort of what your, what do you, what's your favorite? What do you, what do you recommend? What do you think has worked particularly I mean, first well? Of all, first of all, I think your word is perfect dialogue heavy. I think it, that's a perfect description because I, I, I was, my, all, my example is always just look at the first chapter of Pride and Prejudice. It's entirely rendered in dialogue apart from a bit of authorial narration at the beginning and a bit at the end. So all of that unfolds between a conversation between Mr. and Mrs. Bennett and we are told so much information and it is so theatrical. Um, so she, and she has um, entrances and exits. Everything is, I think, created in a very um, stage theatrical way. You know, she knows the moment of high points and when to pull it back. Someone's coming through the door. You think it's someone else, but it's not, you know, so she's playing with all of these conventions, but the dialogue is crucial. She does not give, full descriptions she allows people to learn about people through their dialogue so she is dialogue heavy and she owes that to theatre 100 percent um just quickly answering your questions i know we're running out of time um i have a problem with some adaptations i mean i, I like the adaptations that stick quite closely to her dialogue mm -hmm. and i think to, you know to be fair to andrew davis when he did um his um adaptation of pride and prejudice he said it, you know, it was all Jane Austen. I just, I just stuck to the, st the script, and the reason that it's, it, it's, it worked so well is because he stuck so much to the script. Um, I, my favourite is Clueless. It will always be Clueless, um, which is so funny because it's, you know, it's, a, it, it's transposed to, to Beverly Hills. Um, but I think in terms of capturing the wit, um, the warmth, the characterization. Um, the energy of Jane Austen's writing, that is the one that most for me. I think if Jane Austen were alive today, she, she would love it. Would love it. <laughs> she would yeah. say, how brilliant. Because it also, because of the use of the voiceover, it, 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 it allows you to, um, to have free and direct speech. And the big, big problem with any adaptation of Jane Austen is you lose free and direct speech, which means that you don't get the irony. So you get all the beautiful sparkling narrative, uh, comedy and the dialogue and the plot points and all that. What you don't get is the free and direct speech. And I think how Amy Heckling got around that was having the voiceovers. So because you, we get inside Cher's head, we know when Cher gets it wrong and it makes it doubly funny. 
So we're laughing at her, we're laughing with her. So to me, Amy Heckling is the one that, that is most true to Jane Austen because yeah. of the voiceover, which is the interior voice, if that makes sense to you. Yeah, absolutely. To, to that, the spirit you know, I love them all. Of I, mean, I do love them all. I, mean, I love the uh, Amanda Root persuasion because it is just so, so magisterial, so beautiful, so poignant. Um, so, I mean, I, and I think they're great gateways to the novels. I think people, some people, some readers do struggle with some of the novels, young readers, and I think that all the adaptations are, are great. So I, I love Clueless, but I mean, there's not one that I really hate. Um, I think, and I think they'll just keep going. I think, well, I mean, I really want a new Mansfield Park. I want a really, really good man. I don't think anybody's really done Mansfield Park well. They've not really understood it. And I, I, I'm i praying for the day that we get a great Mansfield Park. <laughs> well, I think that's because of all of the things we were just talking about, isn't it? It's a difficult one. It's not quite as cut and dry as some of, you know, Sense, Sensibility, Pride and Prejudice. They're pretty, it's pretty clear who's good and who's not. And actually, Mansfield Park is difficult you know it's a heroine that isn't easy to like or understand what she's doing she is a bit of a prude you know there are all those problems with it but yes let's put out a plea for a new Mansfield Park that's um <laughs> that's, a, that's a good I'm wish for 2021. <laughs> <laughs> oh well, Paula thank you so much that's been such a joy to talk to you I feel like we've all you know we've really sort of immersed ourselves in Austin and theatre and that's just been it's been really special thank you so much Oh, thank you for having me, Sophie. And thank you for your brilliant questions. And um, and thank you to the people uh, out there who asked their questions. And I hope I answered them, but I'll always answer them on Twitter if I haven't. So, But thank you so much. And it's been lovely to be with you all. And I hope you enjoy this interview. Well, thank you everyone who joined us this evening for Austin Wednesdays. I was speaking to Paula Byrne um, and the book that we kept on uh, referring to was this one this is the genius of Jane Austen and it is available at all good bookshops and I would highly recommend it it's fascinating um a really good lockdown read um especially when we can't get to the theatre in person at the moment but this is kind of the next best thing um so if you've enjoyed this please do um share on social media tell your friends tell people about it talk talk to us about it tell us what you what you enjoyed what you'd like to see next we always want to hear from you um and please do join us again next month for austin wednesdays thank you so much bye <laughs>